gives me great pleasure to invite you to the next seminar um, in the seminar series, which is around the table two fallacy. In the interest um, of time, Mark, do you want to just switch to the... Um, in the interest of time, because we are starting only 10 minutes late, I'm kind of delighted to introduce Mark Gilthorpe and, and Ridder, who's going to, to deliver the seminar today. But we can pick, if anybody's interested in their background or kind of the context, they can ask that in the questions time. I'm, I'm quite keen to get started. If you do have any questions for us, we're going to leave questions until the end of the talk. They can be submitted on Slido and the information is, is on the slide here, or you can indeed just submit them on the chat on Teams. What I do want to say is please, please, and I encourage everybody to ask questions, and I want to really make the environment that no one, no question is a silly question. Some, some of the methodological things which we're going to talk through in these um, next few seminars might be quite challenging, um, so please, please ask questions, and no question is a, is a silly question. OK, next one, Mark, please. OK, over to you, Mark. OK, thank you, Claire. So uh, you know, this will be two part. I'm going to introduce some of the methodological concepts, not heavy in theory, but just nevertheless uh, methodological. Uh, and then Ridder is going to introduce an illustrative example. So to introduce Table 2 fallacy and explain its uh, relevance or impact. I'm going to first discuss the importance of the d difference really between prediction and causal inference. So I'll start with an overview uh, of the fact that data science really breaks down into three pillars. Um, as Miguel Hernan from Harvard has um, classified it, I think it's very useful. Two of those are very familiar to you most people. Description is fairly self-explanatory. Prediction is most of the technical stuff. And then causal inference is kind of something that people may have heard about, but don't necessarily know the full details of. Um, but it's important to draw the distinction out. So description is fairly uh, self-explanatory and very important for big data to use visualization tools to actually understand what's in the data. But it's heavily data driven, clearly data driven. You can ask questions such as what happened, who was affected, what's the occurrence of one condition in people with another condition. So it's a kind of cross tabulation or much more sophisticated insight, but it's it's just data driven visualization. So the type of question you might ask of this is what is the risk of death safe from COVID-19 among bald men? Um, now, prediction is probably something that you are familiar with from a computing background as classification or for some social sciences, regression techniques, but they're really just a classification or pattern recognition uh, exploration of the data, data mining tool really, and it's used for forecasting. Once again, no matter how sophisticated this is, it's always data driven. The questions that would be asked in this situation is what will happen in the future? Who will be affected in the future? And are people with condition X more likely to have condition Y in the future. So a typical question for this would be, are bald men more likely to die from COVID-19? The causal inference is also a form of prediction, but it's predicting counterfactuals, the things that, as in counter to what actually happened, you're trying to estimate things that aren't observed from the observed data. It focuses on understanding the data generating process behind the data that you're examining, but also brings external theory to bear. So the understanding of the data generating process isn't explicitly obvious in the data, it has to have external theory. So you combine the external knowledge, the theory that you have about the data, data generating process, and combine that with the sophistication of all the prediction tools in order to get causal inference. But it's definitely not data driven because that external knowledge matters. So the questions that you have would be what will happen if such and such unfolds? Why were some people affected? So looking at the mechanisms and understanding those mechanisms. And then this is the crucial bit. If we change something, if we change the condition now, how would it change the, a different condition in the future? And that's really an intervention. That's the counterfactual. You're not going to observe that in the data because 
you're creating a hypothetical. So the type of question you're asking there is if a bald man buys a wig and presumably wears it, um, will this reduce his risk of death from COVID-19? But that's a causal question. So the point about prediction is that it's data driven. Now, the algorithms we've got and the complexity of the tools we have are amazing. It's fantastic for, for providing very good prediction. But causal inference requires extra. It's got to be identifying the counterfactuals, which you can't learn from the data, but can only be acquired by mixing the data with encoded external knowledge. So it's actually that that is the process that's novel, that is extra when you come to causal inference. And to try and picture this, just look at it how you would see it from the point of view of a computer algorithm or software um, algorithm. All of the inputs are treated equally. The focus is using all of those inputs to generate the outcome. Whereas we may have a conceptual idea or theory as to how the data came into existence and influenced uh, each other, the, the variables influence each other over time. And that's on the right hand side. And that's a kind of path diagram or causal diagram, which is the basis of how a lot of causal inference knowledge, uh, the external knowledge is encoded. So the most commonly used is the directed acyclic graph, um, which is non-parametric graphical representation with the variables as nodes, squares if they're observed, circle if they're not, the arcs linking the variables showing the direction of cause, and there are no circular paths, so you don't um, variables don't cause themselves in the same moment in time. That doesn't prohibit feedback, by the way. You can have two variables influencing each other, but you have to have temporal repeated measures of those so that they're always affecting each other in the future. Now, this is very useful and usually the first step of most people using DAGs is to identify confounders that need conditioning on to reduce confounder bias. But um, you can't get that knowledge and bring that to bear with the data unless you draw a DAG based on your external theory. When you do that, it actually puts all other variables in the data set into a context because you start with your research question, which identifies your focal relationship by exposure here, variable C, affecting the outcome, variable F. Then it allows you to identify variables in relation to that focal relationship. So if you're trying to estimate the total causal effect of CNF, then you've got to worry about confounders as they create spurious associations that aren't causal. So that's why you condition on them to remove that. And that's important to recognize here, for example, that you may not be able to condition on one because it's not observed. So that you will have confounding bias remain. It's generally not a good idea to condition on mediators because that doesn't give you the total causal effect. It'll only give you the direct effect. But it also runs the risk of many other things I don't have time to go into called collider bias. And that's serious, but I can't tell you about it today. Um, there is also the competing exposure, which just addresses heterogeneity. You might think of this, for example, as multi-center trials and the heterogeneity between the uh, centers can be included as an effect, fixed effects or a random effect. Um, but the main thing is the difference between confounders and mediators. So if you go back to looking at how the predictive model thinks of this, in inverted commas, then it's saying from all of those inputs which are treated equally, then X, any X is correlated with Y or predictor of Y associated with Y. That's what it's trying to find, but purely in order to deliver the predicted Y. Causal modeling, on the other hand, is effect focus. So it takes a step back from the outcome and it asks specifically for a chosen covariate X, like X3 here, for, for instance, what's the total causal effect of X3 on Y? Could also be the direct causal effect or indirect causal effect, but more complicated questions could be asked. But the important point is that you're focusing on the pairwise relationship of the exposure and the outcome, not just the outcome, which prediction is concerned with. So you can now see that even using similar tools, the strategies and philosophies of the two methods differ. So the aim of predictive modeling is to predict values of the outcome. Everything's to do with the outcome. 
whereas the aim for the causal model is to estimate the strength of that causal effect of a particular covariate on the outcome. So it's not purely focused on the outcome, it's now focused on that pairwise relationship. The way that we go about this in principle is to maximize the variance that's explained of the outcome. So we're focusing on trying to improve precision of the predicted outcome, whereas actually for causal inference, it's the accuracy, not the precision of the estimate that's being sought. So we want an unbiased estimate of the causal effect. So we're focusing immediately on different statistical properties. This drives the process of selecting variables. So if you look at covariate selection for prediction, it's about balancing this precision in the outcome being predicted and model parsimony. And that's important because otherwise you overfit. And it means that that prediction model works well in your data set, but not in other data set. So you have to try and reduce the covariate subset. Ideally, most people don't necessarily do this, throw everything in and say that's a prediction model, but a correct prediction model is one which is where you take the candidate covariates and you distill them down to a small subset such that you maximize the joint covariate information and it's joint. It's the maximization of that distillation on the outcome that you're trying to achieve. Covariate selection and causal modeling, on the other hand, is completely different. This is where the external knowledge comes in because you're interested in drawing that DAG. You have to understand where things fit. And it's either established theory or speculation. And that gives you this role of covariates that is different according to how they sit relative to the focal relationship. And therefore, it drives the modeling process such that you minimize bias. And that can be confounding bias, which I've indicated, but also you can take a step back and think about putting a selection node in your DAG and therefore look at factors that influence the selection. So you're not just looking at the data you have in front of you, but you're also considering influences of why you haven't got some of the data in front of you. And that's very important because selection bias is often bigger than confounding bias. Now, this is the unpalatable bit for a lot of people because it actually means, no matter how much people plead otherwise, that prediction model um, coefficients are uninterpretable. Yes, they're an association, but they're not meaningful in any way. But the entire point of the causal model is to give you that interpretability. You're trying to get to what you cause call the total causal effect. So that's why you've done the method to make it interpretable. And at the moment, yeah, prediction models can be done automatically and it's favored by some, although I think human intervention is still better to improve prediction. But at the moment, the human intervention is essential in causal inference because it's that uh, encoding of the external knowledge in the DAG. And that's the bit that we haven't yet automated or even approached systematically consistently yet. So there are some misconceptions as a result of this. I mean, prediction focuses on the outcome, as I say, but it doesn't stop people looking at the covariates and examine associations for individual covariates. Well, they're meaningless, so I don't know why people do do that. But they do probably because they're thinking, conflating prediction with causality. They try and interpret the coefficients as if they're independent effects, which is um, a misnomer anyway, because if they're correlated, a statistical ind independence means they're uncorrelated. And if a lot of covariates are correlated, well, that's meaningless as well. Um, now, although causes can often make good predictors, and that's important from developing a good prediction model, because it means that it, uh, it, it transports well. It is a problem, however, that if you don't measure your causal predictors very accurately, but correlates to those are, are measured with less measurement error or less noisy, then you will find that the correlates, not the causes, end up being selected by your prediction model process, if you're applying one of those. So the best subset of predictors may just be a set of correlates of important causes, not causes. But where they are causes, then it this transportability is important. It emphasizes the importance of model parsimony because if you're going to try and distill fewer covariates out of the candidates to make a good prediction model, you'd want them to be the causal one. And even if you had the situation between a causal and a correlate, the correlate performing better for the reasons I've said, 
human intervention in knowing which is causal, including the causal one, improves transportability. Could you not trying to overfit the data? You want the structure to be the same, and the likelihood, likelihood is that a prediction model based on causal covariates has the same consistency in structure across different settings, even though you have to recalibrate the parameters of the model um, from one setting to another. But um, unfortunately, most prediction models are those pre built without any proper method strategy. Everything just thrown in and everything just interpreted, which shouldn't happen. But we've got increasingly sophisticated and um, instead of just simple regression, we've got all kinds of clever uh, AI tools or machine learning tools, which are overhyped, I'm afraid, to promise all kinds of things. Now, they are good. They're great, in fact, at prognosis, identifying who might need treatment eventually, providing you're prepared to wait till they do. And then that was the utility of the model. Preparing you. Can't actually help you do anything sooner, like an intervention or prevention, because this requires causal understanding. And this distinction is critical because it's unfortunately lost. Um, on most statisticians, because modern statistics in the last 150 years, the frequentist period, um, has been deliberately data driven. That's its mantra. But it's also lost on a lot of data scientists, and com including computing scientists, because um, whilst a lot of ML and AI tools are black box, trying to dig in there and try and uncover the weights of what's going on in this uh, hidden layer neural net is just no more than trying to find the, the correlation, um, the sorry, the regression coefficients from a regression model. They're not informative. So turning a black box into a white box in this way is pointless. In fact, you cannot do explainable AI or ethical AI without causal inference. But why do we make this mistake? Why are we conflating the two? Well, clearly the underpinning methods are very, very similar, but they need to be used in different ways. But it doesn't help also with sloppy language. I'd highly recommend this. It's two pager, very entertaining. And I'd hope if uh, after you read it, you'd never use the term risk factor again, because it's mostly ambiguous and meaningless. There's also a taboo about actually saying we can get causality because people have said you can't with observational data. It doesn't seem to stop millions being spent on observational data analysis. So why are we doing it? Well, if we do it right, you can use the C word. Um, even though some journals say observational studies can't, that's a mistake. And uh, again, Miguel Hernan is campaigning against that. Now, the reason it matters is because this conflation of prediction and causation can actually do harm. Um, so here's something that came out during the pandemic um, in seeking to understand what leads to, i.e. causes, COVID-19 related death. Understanding factors associated with COVID death after adjustment for other factors sounds a bit causal to me. <laughs> then we quantified a range of clinical factors associated with death. As soon as it appeared on archive, we had a bit of a Twitter storm. Uh, Ellie Murray from Boston, I recommend you look her up and follow her. She's very active and educational on causal inference. Said, oh, you've fallen victim of the one of those classic blunders which is the table two fallacy, which I'm coming to. Um, because really what it is, is a massive association study, prediction model being misinterpreted through regression curve, uh, as though regression co uh, covariates had causal meaning, which they don't in this setting. It's just one big prediction model. But this didn't stop the French government trying to use the parameters of this model once it was um, finally published in Nature, um, amazingly. Um, to inform their equivalent to our furlough scheme until a causal inference expert took the government to court and it was thrown out. So thankfully, where you have things like smoking is protective in this model, you didn't have furloughing people who were non-smokers and doing harm to those who were. Um, so this is really known as table two fallacy. It's been recognized as a problem for a long time, decades in fact. Um, but this was actually, this came out about over 10 years ago, but it was known in the causal inference community for two to three decades now. Um, that the tradition of throwing everything in and trying to interpret it as if 
everything's mutually adjusted is complete nonsense, but it does appear to be a prevailing habit, unfortunately. So um, in summary, I think it's important to recognize the three pillars of data science because it stops us being blindsided by this massive one that we know very little about generally, which is causal inference. Confused because different strategies and philosophies rely upon similar methods and we're not uh, diligent enough to, to recognize the distinction. I have to mention again the hype of AI and machine learning to pr promise all kinds of things is nonsense without it being integrated with causal inference. And the consequence, i.e. the table two fallacy consequences, are that you get meaningless and uninterpretable results. Um, if you want to be sure of what you're actually getting, you have to embrace causal inference. And the saddest thing for me is that um, I mean, most of the people uh, I collaborate with in this space are not in the UK uh, because the UK and the rest of the world, unfortunately, are 15 plus years behind the US. Um, and uh, that gap is probably getting slightly wider in real time, uh, unfortunately. So we need a lot more education in, in this space. Now, that's the very rapid um, overview of theory. I think it might be easier if, you hand, if I now hand over to Rida and you see an illustrative example. Okay. Oh, and I should say that the, the reading, recommended reading will be mentioned in the email that's sent out after this with the recording, etc. So over to you, Rita, so I'll stop sharing. Can you see my slides? Thank you. Oh, I can see half of them. Yeah, not in uh, display mode. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm just going to do that now. Just one. Yeah, is a is a better now? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Rida. No, it is. Can you hear me? All right. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Rida, a PhD student in causal data science at the University of Leeds, and I'm supervised by Mark Top, Andrew Presswitz, and Jati G. Today I will be presenting some work from the first paper of my PhD, which is titled Causal Inference Informed Reanalysis of Factors Associated with Dropout from Weight Loss Programs for Adults. So this is just to give you an overview of what I will be covering in this presentation. So I will start with the research background in order to provide you with the context of the study. I'll briefly outline the two main objectives of this study. I will mention which method we have used for both prediction as well as causal inference. I will highlight the key results and then I'll conclude by providing you with the key take home messages. So identifying which factors cause individuals dropout from weight loss program is very important because it can provide useful insight into adaptation that could increase the impact of these programs. But unfortunately, the existing studies on dropout from weight loss intervention do not provide any causal interpretation as they are only focused on recognizing that some predictors are selected over others from a pool of all the candidate predictors. And these do not allow any causal interpretation, which limits their utility to inform any sort of possible adaptations. Hence, this study focuses on illustrating these issues through the directed acyclic graph informed reanalysis of existing data in the literature in the hope of increasing awareness and understanding of these issues and therefore improving the quality of the statistical analysis undertaken in this subdiscipline of academia. The main objectives of reanalyzing secondary data sets were, first of all, to find out if and by how much findings might differ between a prediction and a causal inference approach in the context of dropout from weight loss programs. And secondly, to recognize the associated methodological issues in both prediction as well as causal inference. So we use data from eight systematically identified studies which were published between 2013 and 2020 on factors associated with dropout from weight loss programs. 
The papers were limited to those published in English and published between 2013 and 2020. So 2013 was the year in which the Open Science Framework began. We used that to maximize the chances of accessing the data sets of the included studies. And 2020, because that was the year in which I conducted this, the search strategy. And so the eight primary analysis tried to identify factors that predict or are correlated with whether a participant dropped out of the weight loss intervention without recognizing that this might end up conflating the two distinct tasks of data science, prediction and causal inference. So figure one here shows the prisma flow diagram, which illustrates the number of records identified included, excluded, as well as the reason for the exclusion. The initial search identified 3,691 potentially relevant papers, of which 3,460 were excluded at the title and abstract screening stage. 231 were full text screened. Aside from the requirement for the availability of the data set, 22 studies, including three ICTs, met the full inclusion criteria. The authors of 14 studies were unable to share the data sets for multiple reasons. For example, they moved from that institution, they don't have access to it right now. Whereas data from eight studies for which we, we gave, they provided us with the access, I realized that for both prediction as well as causal inference. The same data sets were reanalyzed for both prediction as well as causal inference. To identify predictors, a single model containing a full set of variables was developed. It is worth noting that a single model which includes all the variables is not an ideal prediction model because we will normally try to avoid overfitting the data and find a subset. Again, this links to the marks point. Um, but we didn't do that here because our, because our aim was not to find the best prediction model. Our aim was to compare all the variables that were made available in the prediction model with the causal inference approach. To estimate the causal effects, a directed acyclic graph was co-produced with authors from each original study and multiple models were generated depending on the exposures of interest. So here I'm briefly describing the five steps that were followed to draw the directed acyclic graphs. So first of all, we need to develop and state the research question. So what is the causal effect that we are interested in estimating? And this was applied to all the variables in the study for which the individual investigator teams expressed interest. Secondly, we consider and state the temporal context in which the variables within the available data sets were considered to have crystallized. And by crystallized, we mean when the variable stops changing in terms of its capacity to cause other variables in the study. And then thirdly, we co-produced the study directed the cyclic graphs in discussion with the original study lead authors in order to gain their domain specific knowledge and identify all the relevant variables and also to address any sort of uncertainties in the temporal order of crystallization. And if deemed necessary, multiple DAGs were identified. And then we draw the DAGs with the variables in the temporal order of crystallization, adding all forward arcs unless the domain expertise justifies that they do not exist, which is very strong assumption and requires strong evidence. But this was not the case with our reanalysis. And then finally, we use each directed acyclic graph to inform and interpret our models for each research question, so for each focal relationship of interest. So this figure here shows one of the directed acyclic graph that was generated for reanalysis in order to identify the adjustment set. The adjustment set is the set of variables that need to be included in the regression model. The double arrows here are used to indicate that they are potentially causal to everything that follows. And this prevents them from looking like a spaghetti monster because otherwise you would have arrows from all these variables going into these variables. 
And so you can only adjust in what, in other words, include in the model, the confounders. So the common causes of the exposure and the outcome, and you cannot adjust for, for mediator. Again, this links to the maps point. And so the mediators are the variable that sit on the causal path between the exposure and the outcome. So just to give you an example, for example, to estimate the effect of weight on dropout. So weight is our exposure and dropout is our outcome. We would adjust for gender, age and height as these are the indicated confounders. But we would not, for example, adjust for weight circumference because that is a mediator. It sits on the causal path between the exposure weight and drop out the outcome. And this would block the true causal path if we would adjust for it. So therefore we cannot estimate the total causal effect. BMI here is a composite variable which is fully determined by height and weight and that's why it's indicated in these double boxes. So none of the primary studies could inform causal interpretation as they used methods which were not suitable for causal inference. So there were some differences in the coefficient generated by the prediction and causal inference model, including sign reversal, indicating that the potential for misinterpreting causal relationship from a prediction model could be severe. But the differences in the available data across the studies that were included and the causal estimate, this indicates that there is definitely some unmodeled confounding bias because we didn't have access to all the variables in all the studies. And the figure on the next slide will show the results of one out of the eight studies that were reanalyzed, but overall the results were different across studies. So figure three here shows the plot with the probabilities for the impact of various variables on dropout. So the results from the dag inform models are indicated by the first vertical interval and the results from the prediction model are indicated by the second vertical interval. And these are from the Aller and Van Bach study that was included in our reanalysis. The systolic blood pressure has the same probability in both the dark informed and the prediction model because it is the closest to the outcome, which you can see here from the dark. And therefore, their adjustment set is identical, since the values are the same. And there is a big difference for the variable weight. And this could be an example where the coefficient for the models are reversed in sign, in which case prediction being interpreted causally could be very misleading. So to conclude, a high proportion of studies in this area suffer from various analysis related biases. So for example, all eight studies that were reanalyzed here suffered from the table T fallacy. So the mutually adjust adjusted coefficients in a prediction models are inferred to have an equivalent interpretation because you cannot interpret other variables other than the exposure because you would need different adjustments depending on which variables you're interested in. And um, simply knowing which variables jointly predict dropout does not provide any sort of causal insight for each individual variable because, the, as I mentioned earlier, this would require a difference of adjustment. Our findings suggest that a causal inference evaluation informed by an appropriate directed acyclic graph should be considered if the goal is to determine which late weight loss program adaptations are required to re reduce dropout. Here is some recommended reading if you're interested in learning more about prediction versus causal inference, directed acyclic graphs and table two fallacy. Thank you very much for listening. I would be happy to take any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark, Mark and thank you, Rida. Um, we've had some great questions uh, coming through on the Slido and do keep them coming, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move straight, straight to the questions. So the first question um, is, how do we collect the external knowledge and judgment? Is this based on evidence and how is this evidence collected and evaluated? 
perhaps Mark, if I come to you first. <laughs> it's a chicken and egg, isn't it? You can go <laughs> to the literature and see what evidence it suggests, but it'll be based on mostly prediction models, so it won't be proper evidence. Um, well, I think the, the, first of all, I think the outline that Rita gave for the development of a DAG using temporality is pretty key. So there's some things you can uh, take just out of the physics of nature. Um, but actually, I think that you, you know, it's a tricky one because you have to go with what you think is the best uh, evidence or the best guess. You might call it uh, clinical impression or whatever that you have. And expert opinion uh, has to come to a consensus on that, but it doesn't mean that you necessarily have all the right answers and know the truth. And in fact, as Rida indicated, maybe you need to consider multiple different DAGs for different alternatives and do sensitivity analysis. And then across um, several studies over time, the whole point of our evidence evolves and science evolves. Maybe you get a consensus emerging that you you, you can believe on uh, is true uh, based on causal methods rather than just prediction. OK, thank you very much. Um, and so we could talk about these for lots and lots more time, but I'm going to move through the questions because they do touch on lots of different topics. OK, so the next one is directed to you again, Mark. The so Mark, please could you explain why explainable AI needs causal inference? Are there any examples of this going wrong? Uh, yes. Um, well, I think that, that the current uh, approach with explainable AI is that um, it's the kind of uh, geekiness, I guess, and then I don't, I mean that affectionately, not critically, of the computing science community that wants to try and un unravel what its black boxes are doing and just focusing on the processes. I'm not sure that's actually giving any insight. So these so-called white boxes um, and um, there are plenty of examples of that. In fact, I'm going to actually ask Rita to mention some of her experience on that. They don't necessarily give you meaning. They just simply give you weights, which are actually like trying to get equivalent to regression coefficients out of a machine learning algorithm. When it, we knew that the regression uh, coefficients were useless, why would we want the weights? Um, yeah, you've been involved with stuff with this, Rita, haven't you? Yeah, so I've done one project with the Alan Turing where we will use some of these techniques. So the most popular being the Lime and Sharp. So the Lime is a local interpretable model agnostic explanation. And Sharp is a sharply addit additive explanation. But again, both of them were, although they are going in the right direction in terms of including some sort of knowledge and trying to interpret things. But they, I would, I would still say that there are some of the main limitations with them. First of all, let's say the let first of all they are not giving you using a model and then generating trying to trust a model just based because it was a black box initially and you're trying to make it as a white box. It doesn't make it trustworthy just because you're trying to add some more visualizations to it. Plus, it's very hard to interpret because when we were doing the plots ourselves, we were trying to make sense of it. But it wasn't clear to ourselves while we, we were trying to understand each of the dots, what it means. So there is still some sort of like, um, from my interpretation point of view, it's, it's still not very clear. I think the fact that we've just seen explain just means laying out in the chat there. Um, doesn't actually cut what I think a lot of people think they get out of explainable AI. Because, for example, if you want to explain the degree of um, gender bias, say, in a, in a prediction model, um, then the weights won't tell you that. And even if you look at anything directly related to gender, it won't tell you that. But um, so that's why you need causal inference for ethical AI. So if you had a recruitment prediction um, process that looked at historical data in a firm that had a history of saying being a little um, sexist in the past, it would continue to project that forward for any new employees. And you can't remove that by looking at the weights. You have to understand the causal effect to remove it. So I think perceived use of explainable AI is a bit more than just laying out. I think that's where it needs to be careful. I think it's also about the biases. You know, when you're trying to use post hoc explanation, they do not render your initial initial back book model any tr better, like in terms of trust, because the traditional machine learning algorithms, they learn a large number of, you know, false and misleading correlations which you input in your data. 
and this does not make it any better for interpretation perspective. So I think that was my main concern when I was working on those things. Yeah. yeah. Thank you both uh, again. So, sorry to hold some of these really interesting conversations along, but we have had quite a few questions. So the next one, um, it says, I'm not sure of whose talk they were meant to referring to, but you mentioned causal inference is useful for large data. What sort of sample size would you need for useful, I'm assuming, useful causal interpretation? Did I mention that? I, I, I thought visualization is great for big data. I think causal inference is great for any data, and it's done properly. Um, I think the real risk with big data um, or whatever it is, that concept, is that it's acquired without necessarily thinking about its provenance. And that means that it could well be conditioned on all kinds of things for selection. So actually the importance of causal inference then comes in to deal with big data, but it doesn't mean that you just you just apply a simple DAG and, and you can roll away and everything's fine. I think that's the point where you need to put selection nodes in your DAG and understand the provenance of what drove that routine data perhaps collected for one purpose being used now in your context or even if it was the same purpose what selection process is limited what you don't see so that's where I think the utility of causal inference comes in but it has to be applied and that's dealing with collider bias which is a whole new topic um, but maybe one of the future lectures uh, seminars or whatever but we're not covering it here but that's where I think it has greatest utility with with big data and sample size is irrelevant unfortunately um, because we don't do null hypothesis significance testing anyway in observational data because sampling variation bias is generally the least of your biases and in the big data set it'll be negligible compared to all your other biases so doing p-values is a no-no in observational research but uh, people still do it obviously but it is about as good as doing prediction and then interpreting the predictions okay thank you um Rida, a question um for, for yourself now um, I think th this question is referring to, to the graph you showed of your results, so if it would be helpful to flip back, you can, but don't worry. So yeah. as there is very little difference in the over in most of the overall estimates, why would people need to do causal inference? Yeah. Just might be, yeah, great, if people can see the graph again, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so I agree with the point that the results are not very different. So, for example, here, if you look at weight, for example, the weight matter from a prediction perspective, but it didn't matter much from a causal inference perspective. So although the differences are little here, but because the implications can be very bad, depending because there are people at the ends of it, uh, for weight, especially this is targeted at weight loss intervention. So you have to think more about not just the numbers but the implication that it can have if the results from a prediction models are used and interpreted to make any sort of like policy interventions or you know inform any sort of results in a more valuable way when they actually are not that trustworthy because they are not using the right methods so it's more about implications but here because there are people at the end of it so you have to be a bit more careful with what you're doing and trying to do things the best way you can is the best suggestion. It's not just about the numbers. It's knowing which methods are suitable for, for which task and using them the best you can. I'm sure there are, there is always like work in progress when it comes to these things, but just try to use whatever you think would minimize the biases and would give you the best outcome, like in terms of interpretability as well as understanding because you are trying to intervene, you're trying to make changes and you have to make sure that you're not, you're not, your results are not based on just a prediction model. Yeah, thank, thanks Rida. This question follows on um, quite nicely. Um, so back to you again Rida, um, if you want to take the slide down, you, you can if you like now. But the question is, um, you say that the studies included in your reanalysis didn't follow the appropriate causal methods. What would this look like and how do they differ to what they did? What do they mean by that they didn't use the appropriate causal methods? 
So I, I think what the question is asking is, is what did what did the so you did the real what did you do different the original analysis and the original published papers didn't do okay that's my interpretation of the question okay okay yeah so what we did is uh, we tried to first of all we tried to look into the data a bit more carefully try to see which you know like missingness because all that you need to judge and then try to put them in a temper order in discussion with the original authors so we were trying to understand their per perception about the data generating me mechanism because that's important the external no knowledge that these matters bring is different when you're using a black box model for example you wouldn't think about all those you wouldn't think about the missingness you wouldn't think carefully about which variables you know in terms of compounding you should adjust which are the mediator you wouldn't know exactly what the role they play so when we're trying to use a causal inference approach we are being more explicit about all the assumptions that we're making so that when someone is looking at our results or trying to interpret them, they know which assumptions we have made. If I could also add to that, picking up on the point in the chat, that um, yes, the uh, data that we could consider was obviously the data that was available from the original studies. But when we drew the DAGs, the DAGs that we used for the comparison were necessarily extremely limited. We know that they're missing masses of, of, of additional information so that is exactly why um, we would probably see very small differences because we're not accounting for true confounding of many other factors and we're not going after the, some of the more important causes like uh, things a bit too hard or lack of support being mentioned in the chat there so i think the process that the people went through in these studies um, could be improved by just simply saying if you thought about the wider context stood back and thought about the data you needed to collect you would do a lot better because it's often not sufficient to look at the small sets of data that we've encountered in these studies but we had to work with what we we could and to show the illustrative differences which were some big some small yeah Thanks, Mark. Um, just th there are some questions on the Slido which are kind of re related to the DAG, which I I'm not, there's, there's too many to go through them all now. And so it's things like we assume weight affects fat mass, but isn't fat mass that's contributing to the summative measure of weight? I think those questions highlight almost the qualitative nature of drawing your DAG. And that goes back to the first question that we asked around where do we generate that evidence from? And if you've heard Mark present before, often calls it have a DAG party. <laughs> Shows Mark needs to go to different parties, but I think it is about working with those groups. But I think the last question, which I'd like to finish on, um, in the interest of time to make sure we do finish on time, um, is, and you put the, the caviar paper in, in your talk, Mark, and the question is, what term would you use instead of risk factors? Okay. Um, well, anything that you wanted to use as a, in a prediction model, so if that was your objective, then you're looking for candidate predictors and they they probably get closest to what people think of risk factors. The problem with the term risk factor is that it doesn't distinguish then whether it's a correlative a cause or a cause. And it doesn't necessarily temporally wrap or capture the crystallization of any historical causes. So you need to unpick the amount of physical exercise, the times and the diet and the, all the kinds of things, rather than just saying lifestyle, you know, in a broad sense. And therefore, I'd say instead of risk factor, just talk about factors, which might sound, you know, very, very little difference, but factors which are either correlated with or causally associated with. So in other words, get rid of the risk because that's you know implicit if it's of relevance i presume that it's just a statistical nuance it doesn't really matter the point is the factors that you're interested in either need to be understood as correlates which is useful for prediction but not not beyond or causally related and if you're not sure the point is you can experiment therefore with the data set in a in a dag and do the analysis and ask is there a causal link or is it just a correlate so i would rather be more specific in that language. Yeah, 
and and I do recommend reading the the caviar paper, and it, it is a very short read, very easy read, and, and does provide some alternative terminology dependent upon your your research question. Um, okay, I think we can, in the interest of trying to finish um, on time, Rid, did you have the final few slides for us? Yeah. yeah. Um, unless anyone. Um, so I guess from us um, is to thank everybody um, for attending today. Um, and I hope you found it interesting. Um, and we want to build the, the methodological talks and things that we produce within the Obesity Institute. Um, so yeah, hope you found it interesting. I'm sure we have perhaps challenging, which is also a good thing. Just a few final points from us is that we um, we have now validated a new MSc in obesity, which will run from, from September next year. Um, causal inference method training will be a central component of kind of our MSc and ensuring our students get that understanding moving into the real world. If you want more information, you can kind of contact us directly or you can scan um, the little QR code there. And then if you could just switch to the next one, please, Rida. Um, it's just to highlight for anybody on the call that may have an interest um, in obesity and disordered eating, colleagues in the Obesity Institute are setting up um, an international network. So if, if it is a topic area that's of interest to you and you would like to get involved in the network, again, the, the information is on the slide or you could just scan, um, scan the, the QR code again for more information. And then I think the last one is just to say, yeah, that's our questions. We've done that one. Thank you, Ridda. Um, and then again, just everyone that's on the call today might be really interested to attend the next seminar in our series, in our series, which is again presented by Mark and Ridda, um, entitled Composite Variable of Bias, and it builds on some of the things which we touched on today and some of the more methodological pitfalls um, in observational research. So I'm sure you'd be very keen to get that date in your diary and I'm sure we'll be reminding you in the run up to that anyway. Um, so with one minute to spare, I'd just like to take the opportunity to say thank you to Mark and Ridda again for a fantastic and thought provoking presentation. And also thank you to everyone for attending and the really insightful questions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.